guess is they uh, they're all pretty similar except for guys that obviously played PPPK. Um, but five on five, I think uh, you know we were, I know we were real happy with uh, with uh, all six D and and the lines and everybody uh, you know contributed as you said. So um, it was a, a real good team win. Indeed it was. Judd's Hockey Show. Zolgad and Declan Goff with you. Um, this is, what, Thursday morning. We are speaking after the Wild played an afternoon tilt against Arizona. one 5 5-2 to at the X on Wednesday. And Declan Goff, a few subjects to get to off an impressive win. Mm-hmm. Which was, you know what this all goes back to, too. And this is, you know, this is a credit to the Wild, all right? All right this goes me. back to our preseason discussion um, when we saw what the divisions were going to be, right? And I think we basically had a long conversation about if you beat up on the teams that you should beat, yes, you're going to be in good shape because you've correct. got you've got the Kings and you got the Sharks and you got the Ducks and the Coyotes aren't as big a disaster, but they're certainly not, they're not good, good, right? Yep. <laughs> so so and I think I use the term this is a blessing because you know Colorado's going to be tough and they are. The Golden Knights are going to be tough and and they are, but the Wild, to their credit, have played them well. And St. Louis is tough. But the Wild has done, it seems like, an extraordinary job of beating up on the teams that they should beat. And the Coyotes fall into that group. And the thing that I like about this club is that this is three years ago, two years ago. If you were in this division, how many weird losses like to the Coyotes oh, yeah. would we be talking about, right? Like, just weird. And I, I get the fact that you're not going to beat them every single game. But, you know, we'd be talking about... Something going sideways yesterday, right? Wouldn't we? We'd be talking about that weird goal. And by the way, Dubnik made his um, debut with the Avs last night against St. Louis, and they hung on to win, and I watched the uh, game. And Dubnik allowed a classic Dubnik goal. Oh, Dubnik. Centered in front. Dubnik. Centered. Puck got centered. He's in his cage, but he's not fully cutting off the post. Hits him in the back, rolls up his, rolls onto his back, and into the goal. So anyway, those are the type of goals that we became used to against, you know, in weird situations. So kudos to the Wild. You've done a very good job, I think, for the most part, of winning the games that you should win. And in the division that you've been gifted, that's going to take you a long way. Like, as far as your finish is going to be decided by the fact that you're opportunistic. Yeah, all you had to do was just beat up on these horrible teams. Uh, Maybe some of these aren't horrible teams. Kings are a little better than we thought. They're not as good as you. Right. Like, we know that, right? And we knew the Ducks and Sharks uh, weren't going to be very good. The Yotes are, yeah, kind of in the middle there. The Blues are the uh, the surprising one because mostly the Wild have had fits against them. They can't really seem to beat them for whatever reason. Uh, but in general, yeah, if you took care of business against these bottom feeders, it was going to put you in a good position. And what's so funny about this game, funny little game, is that Vegas is one of the most deepest and best teams in the NHL, and the Wild match up to them very well. They do. If, if they play them in a seven-game series, I, th- I think it's going seven. I really think it's going seven. It would be, a, and it'd be entertaining too. Oh, it'd be great. It'd be a great series if you play. Totally with you. You play Colorado in the first round. It is over. I, I think maybe you get one because it's hockey, but I, you would get waxed out of the building. But I do think if you match up against Vegas, uh, you're going to be in a good position. But g- good on the Wild to continue to beat up on uh, on the Yotes and 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 the Kings and the Sharks of the world. All right, let's get to the talking points. Um, I want to start with this one: okay. the the Wild power play. It's working. It was never as bad as it was early when it was. At less than 10%, okay? We knew that. Like, it was... The incredible thing is, it was that bad for that long. Yes. Yes. You know, a streak of ineptitude is not surprising. Correct. All, all teams go probably, aside from, like, the 85 Oilers, through that. The streak of ineptitude was not surprising. It was the length of the streak of ineptitude that <laughs> was surprising. But yesterday, 3-for-3 three three on the power play. Uh, past 12 games, Declan Goff. 14-for-35. for 35. They are now up to 23rd, which is a great accomplishment for this club. 23rd in the National Hockey League in power play percentage at 17.1%. And let me start you with the interesting factoid about yesterday's game. Okay. Yesterday's power play success. Two of those goals, my good man, (laughs) came from not the first grouping, but the second grouping of of Zuccarello, who scored both those goals. Zuccarello. Hartman. Hartman. Your guy, Joe Hansen, who, by the way, looks like a different guy now. Yeah, he does. He's playing well. I'll give him credit. Suter and Dumba. But the point is, that's the group that scored two goals. And this power play 
if it's going to click, this is a good time to start to click. Because if you can get if you can get a version that probably falls somewhere between the complete horse bleep that we saw and this, because this isn't probably not going to keep up at this rate, or it's not probably, it's not going to. No, no, no. But if you can go into the playoffs clicking at sort of a happy medium percentage between those two, you're probably in decent shape special teams-wise, right? Totally. You knew that the Wild yeah, weren't going to be that inept on the power play. I mean, it was historically bad. They're on pace to shatter the NHL record. Um, yes, they have, and they have good players. The, the execution wasn't there. I don't know if it was the lines, it was the utilization, just bad luck. Everything was, was working against them. But if you're going to be able to at least just be league average on the power play, which is, where, which is what we're trying to trend them to be and pigeonhole them to be, because we know that it's not going to be this good. I believe what I saw a note over the, in April, the Wild have the best at least power play on home ice. I mean, they had three power play goals yesterday against the Arizona Coyotes. So, you know, that, that, that that's a good sign. Your power play finally is waking up. And if you can at least be competent, I feel a lot better about going into a playoff series uh, because you, you could not really make a significant noise in the playoffs if you were clicking at 6% in the power play, which is what it was the first basically, yep. you know, two months of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and guys like, you know, the, the uh, now I wasn't there yesterday, but the Kaprizov setup. W- w- Kaprizov, was that a power play goal that he set up? Uh, and was it the Benino. B- the Benino goal? Yep. And that was him guarding traffic, Getting a lot of attention and basically throwing a puck, right? I mean, did he? Did it he went up goal and got no, no. He he accident he accidentally, but he's so good. He he centered the puck for for ben, or no, I'm sorry. I think he was trying to make a pass. Okay, the pass itself, I don't know where the pass exactly was supposed to go, but the pass went the puck went off Goligoski skate and rebounded perfectly in front to. Benino, who is now the new net front presence guy, and he scored. Hmm. Um, no, Kaprizov made another play. In, in fact, I tweeted you, I think I tweeted at you about this one. I don't know that this was a power play, I don't recall. He made another play, and it was just a small, subtle thing. Uh, he brings the puck into the coyote zone, basically stops right in front of right near his own bench, okay? He then pivots to use his back to shield himself and the puck. From the defender. He then makes a be between the legs blind pass. It was incredible. It was absolutely, and it was a and it led nowhere, and it mm. was a split second. And so if you sure. look down to take a sip of beer, you missed it. But it was incredible. But here's what I want to bring up about the power play because I tweeted this and it seemed ill-timed, but I don't think it's ill-timed. The second unit looked really good. And by the way, this is a miracle. This is a this is a miracle. Matt Zuccarello shot twice to score those goals. Wow. Yeah. He's a um, pass and, pass. And the first one, I don't think he had any outlet to pass to. Okay. The second one, I'm not so sure, but he still shot. And and I think this is I think you brought this up last year. He's got a good shot. He does have a good like, shot. Like, use it, dude. He, he just doesn't shoot a lot, yes. No, I know, but, like, there's no... That's not a good excuse. Sure. Like, you're good enough. It's not like you have this feeble shot. Anyway, um, so I brought this up on Twitter, and it's the one thing I don't get. The first unit still, okay? So, Rask was on the point in St. Louis and got burned badly. Victor Rask on <laughs> the point is as... It's coaching malpractice. Yes. Like, he can't he play there. Up, yeah. He's got no chance. <laughs> so, so as they lined up yesterday for a face-off, first power play, I think this was power play one, um, it was Spurgeon and Kaprizov at the points. Okay. And now, now Kaprizov goes in and becomes the bumper, which I don't know is a great call, but anyway... Um, and then the winger, and then the wingers were Fiala and Benino and Rask in this sense, because I think he was on his strong side, took the face off. I am not advocating for both Rask and Benino to be pulled off the power play. I don't understand why both are on it. Uh, yeah. And I don't understand why Rask is on it. And here's the thing. So Dean, I think Dean's thing is, well, we're so bad on faceoffs. If one of them gets kicked out, I can have the yeah. other rotate in. Okay, first of all, to me. No, non-starter. Second of all, you can do better than Victor Rask on the ice, on the power play. And let me give you one guy. What about Marcus Foligno? If you want to try something, what about Sturm? Right. Who can play center, right. who's faster than Rask. I now, now, 
Rask might have better offensive, a better offensive mindset and skills, but if you can't use them because you're not fast enough to keep up, I don't really care. Like, like I think Victor, I think if you trans, I think if you teleported Victor Rask back to the 1992 season and stuck him on a power play, Might he's work. probably pretty good sure. because he's not super slow then. Right. Um, but that's the one thing that, despite the success, that's the one thing I don't get. Tell me if I'm crazy here because this power play is going pretty well. Uh, I actually right now. In totality, like the second group more, though, because of what they're saddling um, three really good players on the first group with. Yeah. I don't like Benino and Rask on the same unit. I don't think, and, and honestly, in a perfect world, on a better team, um, on, a, on a maybe, I won't say better coach team, neither of those guys is even close on a power play, on a, on a competent unit. Um, but because the Wild are so hell-bent on winning a face-off and because they are so hell-bent on fixing the power play, they're basically putting anything they can against the wall, throwing it what against it and see what sticks. And um, and I guess Victor Rask for them and Nick Benino works for it. That's great. Whatever. Like I don't care. If the power play goals come, I'm all right with it. Um I, I think though, in general, but your top unit, to go back to your point, like you have players on this team too who should be able to contribute on the power play. Matt Zuccarello is is good on the power play. Priestoff and Fiala should be on the power play. Zach Parisi, who I know we're gonna get into very shortly, is makes his bread and butter in front of the net on the power play. So yeah, if the when first play it on the if, if the first unit <laughs> yeah. um, can at least be competent, then yeah, that second unit can can hopefully go out there and 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 be at least somewhat okay. Um, I'm I'm curious to see if it can at least trend in the right direction consistently and and be at least um, sustainable. Because as, as we talked earlier, it, it's probably not sustainable with how the amount of goals they're performing right or scoring right now. But in the for the previous two months, that was also unsustainable just with how putrid it was. So sure. if these units are working and Dino's pushing the right puppet strings and, and Garen involved as well, um, I think it's a good thing for the Wild. It, it just helps their playoff ca- ca- cause if you can at least be somewhat coherent on a power play. So good for the Wild to finally figure that out at the probably the best time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I just think that you want that first unit to be more cohesive and right now I think the second group is a better group as far as the whole group than the first group. The first group has three really good players and uh-huh. the, the Benino so so it's now um Kaprizov is the bumper which means he's he is mid slot there and he he's the guy that the puck can go through. Benino is the net front guy which I that's fine. Now personally in my world I think Marcus Foligno would be my net front guy. Okay. But anyway, Benino's fine there. It's just it's the Rask is actually now a facilitator and he doesn't usually move fast enough in my opinion to be that person. So I just I think that there's alterations here that that if they had scored all three goals, I'd say it's fine. Sure. But they didn't. They scored one goal and and to me, the Zuccarello goals were more were more of of a function of a really good power play. All right, let's get to it next. In fact, I've got a, I've got some a picture here for him. Okay, for you. Let's talk about this guy, ZP. That's right. Zach, I like to call him Zach Parisi. Friend Zach of the show. Parisi. So Zach Parisi has um, certainly been uh, prone on this show before to hmm. criticism of what he has done and not done. What? And uh, you know what? He is a highly paid player who deserves that. But he also deserves to be praised when when it's called for, and I think right now it's called for. So Zach Parisi, and I don't know what the backstory here is. I have no idea. But Zach Parisi missed, um, I believe it was seven games on the COVID-19 protocol list, despite the fact that I think he said he didn't have it or he didn't feel a, a, a thing. So I don't know if he tested positive or what. That's not the point. The point is he's come back, and I think it's four games since then that he's played. He was put on the fourth line, which yesterday was was Sturm at center, who by who by the way I really do like, yep. and Benino on the right wing and Zach on the left wing. Fourth line though, so this is not this is not like the third line that might bump up to the second. This is a line <laughs> that played really well, but it was the fourth line. <laughs> Prezi uh, scored a goal yesterday on a nice pass from Benino. He made a great feed on a goal in, I think it was the second period, to Jared Spurgeon. He has two goals in his past three games. He, I think yesterday, had the best game that I've seen him have in quite some time. Like, it was a complete game, drew a penalty, mm-hmm. w- well beyond the box score. He did a lot of things. Played his, played hard, which he ordinarily does, but he played hard and he played effective. Uh, he saw zero time on the power play, Declan Goff. 
He saw zero time on the penalty kill, so he played five on five, and that was it. But I don't know what happened here, but it looks like, at least for now, he has embraced this role. And if he does, if he embrace, and yes, he has paid far too much to be in this role, but that's a sunk cost. That's gone. Yep. He embraced the role that he has been given, which is a limited role player type of deal. Nonetheless, I think he deserves to be praised for that because if he can get his head around who he has become, yep. I think there is no question he can become a key contributor in that slot for this team. Look, we, we've we been hard on Zach, and, and in general, this is a podcast uh, that is usually more critical of the Minnesota Wild, even though they've been playing well this year. And I think in general, because they have been playing well this year, Judd, we haven't been as critical as this uh, on this team that we have in years past on this podcast. Now, Zach, who, yeah, missed seven games, he's back now, and I think what is very, uh, what what's telling here is they have put him in a role. They said, Zach, this is your role. This is who you are. You're you're now a, a bottom six guy. Right now you're playing fourth line minutes, but he's making the most of it. He, they're not they're not rewarding him. They're not just, I would, and maybe we'll, we'll get down this road eventually because he's playing well. They're not just saying, oh, you, you, you scored a goal in your first game back, and now here's uh, here's 17 minutes a night. Go back to being Zach Parisi. We'll, we'll we'll put you in all three units. Blah blah blah. All that all that all that all that noise. Over the last four games, he's only averaging 11 and a half minutes per ice time. Yep. So he's not playing a ton. Nope. He's really not. Nope. But he's making the most of it, and he's executing it. And if this is if this is the production now, a point of game, I don't expect that from Zach or much of any player on this team. But if you if you are able to con- contribute at the amount of minutes he's being used on, like good on you, good on good on Dean, good on Zach for recognizing that this is now your role, Zach Parisi. Like, like as as much as you scored some big time goals, and hey, I'm sure when the Wild go in the po- playoffs, and he is mostly a playoff performer, he's going to score some playoff goals. I'll even say that right now, he will score some postseason goals. He most likely will. You write that down. I, I will. I will write that down. But this is now who he is, and Zach has to accept that. And I think. That's the hardest part. Zach's a pretty prideful guy. I, I don't think that's a, that's a hot take at all. He's he's a very prideful dude. Um, but if this can be the role that helps the team the most and him also get more on the stat sheet, you have to embrace it. And it deserves praise, which is what you did. You wrote a column yesterday praising him, and rightfully so. Yeah, you, Rightfully so. He yes. deserved it. He completely yes. deserved it. I also think, so. so because he's come back and because there now seems to be an acceptance and actually – He's thriving here. Like, here's the thing. It it probably sucks for him to accept it, and he's, what, 36 now. And it's probably very hard to accept X. But the thing about this is the Wild and the coaching staff are right. Like, what they're doing, this is the right. He's, he's partially playing well because he's decided to apply himself completely, and that's a credit to Zach. But he's partially playing well. Because at his age and with where his skill set is now, which is not the Parisi of five years back, right. he also is being used absolutely, to your point about ice time, in a correct manner. Um, I think it's interesting, and I don't know if there's anything at work here, though, but I think it's interesting that he had seven games and an extended time period to get away and clear his head, sure. and, and then he came back like this as well, I, which is I can see that. And and the deadline passed. So here, if there was any hope that that from both sides, because I think both sides would have would love ideally a fresh start, and if there was any hope from both sides, from the Parisi camp or the Bill Guerin Wild camp, maybe we can trade him, which you can't. I I don't think they got a sniff. This time, and with the way that he was playing up to the deadline, they probably shouldn't have. Unlike you know, last year when he led the team, I think he had 25 goals in 69 games, and the Islanders almost traded for him. This time, that was not going to be a possibility. Cleared his head, came back, and now absolutely positively could be a guy who contributes. And I also think it might help in some ways that at least for now, he's on a line with. Benino, who has certainly never been the player that Zach was, but he's won two cups. Yep. He he and like Zach, I mean, he works his ass off. He is a locker room guy. Nick is. He's a locker room guy through and through. And I think to have those guys as sort of uh bookends on that line with a young player in Sturm who is ascending, and I really like him, but I think it's a perfect fit because they can basically look at 
each other, Nick and Zach, as a reflection of where things are at. And there's no shame in that. Like, if you're going to play this role, that's awesome. That's great. Yes. Like, this is what you want. Just, we, in this sense, we have to forget the contract because the contract is just there. That's what it is, yep. And we have to look at, at this and say, and I think that this is what Bill did, and I think this is what probably Dean did. You have to look at Zach now and say, he's here. What what can we all do to make this work as well as possible without expecting him to be top six left wing scoring goals, Zach Parisi? And I think that they have potentially, and in, you know, small sample size, but I think they have potentially hit on something here mm-hmm. that could be incredibly, incredibly important in the playoffs. Yeah, this is big. And if you can just get him rolling, and and things are this is the right time to get things fixed. I.e., the power play, Zach Parisi waking up. This is a good thing for the Wild. You definitely want to be in this situation where you have situa- uh, players and, 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 and circumstances that weren't working for you, and you've been playing well. You've overachieved to a degree, right? You, you've been playing very, very well this season. No one expected the Wild to be this good uh, with 15 games to go left in this shortened season. But if, if Parisi is starting to wake up and the power play is there, the goaltending has still been phenomenally consistent. I think that's that's our that's the biggest thing. Is, is Cam Talbot, yeah, uh, is clearly your number one. We're still trying to get Coppa maybe back to a position where he was comfortable and was the was the goal he was at the beginning of the season. I'm curious if we can get him back there. And I'm sure he'll get some time here with the Wild having a soft spot in their schedule over the next five games. I hope you're right. And and I hope I'm right, too. I, I just don't want the Wild to be... Look, they got San Jose back-to-back coming up. Yeah. Then two against Arizona again. Then the Kings and Sharks. And then we get into some meat and potatoes to close it out the year. So, if anything, over these next six games, to change the topic as we wrap up here... These are perfect times. I, like Capo has to start bare minimum three of these six. Bare, like he has to, they have to split up the tandem here. If you want to get Talbot in against both games against St. Louis and both home games against Vegas before the season ends, I could honestly see him starting at least three of those four. I can see that. You have to figure out a way to keep Capo Cockett and fresh to keep Talbot fresh in the long run. You're preaching to the choir. I'm complete. I completely agree. And and Talbot, look, once the playoffs come, I get it. Ride him. Uh, but you have, but Kapo Kakinen has to play here, and, and I, I fear two things in this town right now. I'm going to give you this, Dex. Okay. Okay. There's two things that concern me. And by the way, I think that both these people are very competent at what they do, despite what people say. Okay. Yep. Two things I fear in this town right now: Dean Evison and goaltending, mm-hmm. and Rocco Baldelli and pitching at times. Um, I think they're different animals. I think that there's something that a lot of us don't get. And I think it's very, in Dean's case, to go to him exclusively in this d- discussion since it is Judd's hockey show. <laughs> in Dean's case, um, I fear it becomes easy to ride the hot veteran hand and just say, well, he's playing well. He's playing great. But in this schedule and in this league now, you can't ride one guy constantly. You just can't. And Kapo Kakinen has shown a lot of things, a lot of good things. Yeah. And so you're right. He should play more. Um, and there is certainly going to be a stretch of games here, as you just articulated, that's going to give them the opportunity to rotate these guys and, and get Kapo in. But uh, I'm growing a little bit concerned that playing the hot hand is just sort of becoming the default a little bit too much. And I'd like to see... I'd like to see something that proves me wrong. Um, and that doesn't mean that Capo is going to get back in and immediately be um, uh, Ken Dryden. I understand that. <laughs> yeah. But he has to play. And you also, and he has to play. And I'm not saying ride him either, but he has to play in part because I need Cam Talbot to be as fresh as possible for the playoffs. Sure. And if I, and if I just go, you know, um, full speed ahead with Cam Talbot just playing well. I I got to play him. <laughs> Do I really want to say what you know? Game three of the playoffs, he struggled. That's that's weird. What happened? So I am completely in your camp. There has to be a way here to play both these guys. I think they will, and I I, I especially over these next soft spot before it, it picks back You're up for the right. end. And I I think they will. All yeah. right, do your thing. Pass shoot score.